Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 689. That's 689 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? You know, all good, all things considered, all good, all things considered. I could complain, I will complain, and all that in between. But apart from that, it's been a fairly topsy-turvy week for me. For some reason or the other, my hay fever and allergies have hit me like a flipping truck. It might have to do with my new flipping inhaler that I've got. It might have to do with me taking an uptick in dosage in terms of what I'm taking in terms of anti-allergy tablets. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a high pollen count. Maybe it's because I think I read in the news recently, we're going to have the most, what is it? The the 14 days of the hottest times or whatever in London or something. Let me see if I can find it actually. London hottest days i'm pretty sure something about like 14 days stretch of back-to-back crazy nonsense which i think actually they're saying actually is true um so the highest temperatures observed what's happened here uh 14 days stretch am i seeing anything on google no okay so far nothing about 14 days i think i'm pretty sure i said i saw something about london or is it uk hot 14 days let's see if that comes up is it a 14 day show? It doesn't matter anyway. Um, there's going to be a long stretch of days in the UK where it's going to be very, very, very hot. And it's been decent, don't get me wrong, because it's nice to see the UK, especially London, under the bright sunlight. Um, it kind of gives a, the, the city a bit of a nicer tint. It puts people in a much better mood. It makes them way more pleasant, especially if you live in a very busy um hustle and bustle city like london it's quite nice to have people say excuse me and thank you and smile at you a few times here and there but apart from that this city is just not designed for the heat or maybe i'm not built for it one or the other or maybe both because the lack of air conditioning the mustiness um the pollen counts the dust all this stuff just negatively affects me to the point where i'm literally in and out of a flipping consciousness when i'm up most of the day if i'm not working it's absolutely terrible so that's been a bit of a bug a bear to kind of handle but apart from that it's been fairly decent um went to back to the gym today for the first time in the whole week which has been a bit crazy so i'm happy about that but that was a hard stock to get through especially considering the gym that i go to you know there's no real windows anywhere which is something you find quite often in a lot of gyms i don't think you find maybe you guys are different where you are but i can't think of any gyms really apart from like crossfit boxes that are like in warehouse units and sometimes they have the, the you know they have the shutters open on either side but i can't think of many places where you go and exercise where there's windows i wonder why that is even like dojos places where you'd go and learn martial arts or striking or combat training or something you rarely see places with windows i wonder why that is maybe there's a health and safety thing with it maybe it's to do with like concentration and focus i don't know but um being in a gym especially in london with no air conditioning is an experience in itself you really have to kind of you know you know do some breath work before you go in get yourself psyched up because you know for sure you're going to be very very compromised in the next few minutes that you're out there so that's been a bit difficult to deal with but you know we can't complain too much um but yeah this is what i saw actually here we go on the flipping news as you can see here courtesy of google news we've got a headline here for the mirror that says a 14 day heat wave to hit the britain as temperatures soar to 40 centigrade um which is going to be flipping crazy extreme conditions are going to be happening next month there's going to be a 14 day spell in next month where i'm going to have to really really be zened out may have to do some meditation i might have to just pour some ice cubes in my flipping bathtub and do something to get myself an even kill because this is going to be looking spooky um met police predict sweltering temperatures up it's so going to be lasting 14 days in july so i'm gonna have to get myself acquainted with this because you know we're going to be going through this for a while um it's actually been pretty decent because i've in my own head decided that i'm not going to really go anywhere in terms of holidays in terms of places really warm i've kind of purposely put into my head i'm going to go to places like maybe from august onwards because of the weather's so fucking crazy i don't want to put myself in a position where i'm literally going to faint <laughs> which says everything about my temperament everything about my ability to handle this type of stuff isn't the greatest as you can tell because i'm clearly running away from it 
I'm the type of person that's hiding underneath the fucking, I'm hiding behind the blinds. I'm not trying to be around in any way, shape or form. I want no parts of this whatsoever. I want absolutely no parts. But yeah, big up everybody out there enjoying it. I'm not, but big up you guys that are enjoying it. Big up you guys that are. One thing that I can say that I'm also not enjoying is the absolute non-movement, the zero non-movement around United and around what's going on with transfers and around what's going on with the sale and the overall takeover of the club. It's no you know, shock to you guys that I keep saying it all the time on here. My mental health is definitely on the brink with this lack of movement with a sale. It feels like the Glazers are somewhat trying to drag this out as long as possible to get as much dollars as they can out of the club and to also potentially, potentially push both bidders in Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Sheikh Jassim in a position where they have to submit a fourth and quote-unquote final bid that's what it's looking like to me at the moment this doesn't seem like owners who want to get out as soon as possible who want to ride out into the sunset with their millions stashed in their side bags no this looks like ownership who are adamant on squeezing every last inkling of money they can out of the club before they leave and for us as fans it's putting us in a really weird position because the summer transfer window is here and usually most fans should be excited and should be hyped about getting linked with players, about, you know, potential deals that are going to be put through, about scouting players online and looking at YouTube clips. That's what we should all be excited about as fans. We shouldn't be concerning ourselves with the old business of the club. That's what something I'm honestly hopeful when the new owners do buy the club, especially if it's going to be Sheikh Jassim in terms of the total takeover, I can't wait to get to a point as a United fan where I'm not discussing ownership. I'm not really getting into the weeds of who our football director is, sporting director is, all this stuff. I just want to be talking about the football on the pitch and about the tactics and about the team selections and about the formations and about the form, play attributes. That's the thing that I actually want to talk about because that's way more fun than getting to all that heady boardroom stuff that probably from most part goes over most people's heads but with that being the case and with us being still owned by the glazers i have to say i'm quite annoyed about this news that we've signed mason mount number one i don't rate him anyway but number two i also think we shouldn't be signing anybody i would go as far as saying we shouldn't be signing players or selling players in any way shape or form until we get new owners that's what I adamantly think because I think the sale of players is going to be influenced by who you can sign. So if Eric Ten Hag has been given assurances that you can go out and sign a certain caliber of player, he's going to sell a certain caliber of player. But if maybe he's told, hey, here are your remit, you can only sign players within this, you know, maybe these positions, whatever, you might then make some adjustments on the size of the squad and who do you want to trim, who do you want to let go and whatever it may be. But I just think in terms of player profile, in terms of just squad management, in terms of who goes in and out, it really makes zero to no sense to sign players now under one regime, only for another regime to come in. That player maybe doesn't kick off as best as possible. They get blamed. They get all the they get all the blame, especially if another player comes in from the new regime that does well, and then suddenly you're hounding them out and you can't get them out of the club. That's something we've been guilty of from the past. We always sign players on these big inflated wages and then when they don't have good seasons we find it very difficult to let them go because no one else is going to pay them that money and if you believe the rumors out there the story is that Mason Mount's getting up to like £220,000 a week. I don't think any other club in the world would pay Mason Mount that money. I don't think any other club in the world would have paid Chelsea £60 million for a player who probably isn't worth more than forty in my humble opinion. So we're in a really, really messed up position now where I think we've essentially been fleeced. We've been fleeced. We've been run a mocker. We have negotiators that don't really know what they're doing. They always overpri overpay. If I remember correctly, I read somewhere that Mason Mount had one year left on his contract. So to be paying sixty million for a player who's got one year left on his contract is insane to me. Um, even if he's just worth a forty million pound player, that means if you had actually decent negotiators and you actually knew what you were doing, or if the club that was bidding for him wasn't Man United, maybe they could have got him for 30 mil, even 20 million, because he's got one year left in his contract. But we, of course, had to pay them 60. And it's pretty impressive for Chelsea anyway, because they've somehow managed to get rid of Kai Havertz and Mason Mount for a combined fee of like, what, more than 100 million or something. That's pretty insane when you think both of those players are you know, both on the decline, I would say. Um, both players who a lot of Chelsea fans would say were at the centre 
of some of their worst performances. Personally, for me, I would say that so. The Mason Mount maybe of a few years ago isn't the Mason Mount we're getting now. And I honestly don't think he's that much of an upgrade to Christian Eriksen. I know a lot of fans out there, United fans specifically, don't like Christian Eriksen. They think he's too slow, which I obviously agree with. He maybe isn't at his former powers, but I think still on the ball, in a decent enough team with runners around him, he can still do something. But I honestly don't think Mason Mount is that big of an upgrade. I don't think it's a big enough upgrade to kind of bench him. Although I'm sure because Eric Ten Hag has purchased him and because their story is coming out now, that Eric Ten Hag originally wanted um, Mason Mount to sign for Ajax when he was managing there before I think he went to Derby or something. I think Mason Mount may have went on loan to Dutch Club, I'm not really too sure. But Eric Ten Hag has been a fan of him forever, so it's not just a random signing out of the blue. So maybe Eric Ten Hag sees something in him that we don't as fans. But I honestly don't think we should be signing any players, like I said categorically until the sale and takeover of the club has been finalized no player should leave or to or should be signed that's just my humble opinion i just don't think it makes sense especially where we're in the final rounds or wrapping up the sale allegedly to be signing players under one regime when you're just going to be under a new regime soon and it's going to put that player on unnecessary stress they might come in other ideas blah 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 it doesn't make any sense to me number two i also don't rate him and i think there are better or more per pernient, um, you know, positions in the squad and the team that need to be addressed. Up front, we still need a striker. I would go as far as saying we probably need to sell Mason Mount, sorry, Martial before we even sign a Mason Mount. We need a striker to, to replace him, maybe even two, especially Weghorst leaving. We need probably a solid enough cover for Casemiro at the back because that's the one position that we have zero cover for him because we don't trust Fred. McTominay can't play that position if you know he's big and strong and whatnot. And clearly, Eric Ten Hag doesn't want to play, um, what's his name? doesn't want to play the butcher there in any way shape or form either so we need a player who can come and slot in at that position we probably need an upgrade on on fullback too in both positions whether it's right back or left back i don't still trust luke shaw i think he's still going to do what he does to us always gets a new contract after playing good for one half of one season and then starts going back to what he usually plays like before so he's a player that shouldn't be there then you got the david de Gea situation we allegedly gave him a new contract then rescinded it because we weren't sure if we wanted him like all these players I think positions need to get addressed before we sign a Mason Mount but we did it anyway because we're Man United because Mason Mount is a marquee English player he's allegedly been signed on the new media PR ownership so it makes complete sense in that regard but I personally don't like the transfer I think it stinks I think it's horrible um, and if anything it's another clear sign that our owners don't know what they're doing because of all the position that we need to address, I don't think a number eight, a number 10, whatever position that he plays is really paramount. I don't think he's that big of an upgrade from what we already have in terms of Christian Eriksen, even a Bruno Fernandes. I don't think he's that big of an upgrade from those type of guys. And really and truly, he's not going to be a difference maker that's going to take us from where we finished last season to maybe challenging for a league or challenging for some more domestic trophies. I don't think that's going to happen. Personally, my humble opinion and the flipping salary that he's getting is wild because if he has a couple of dodgy seasons I don't see how we're going to get rid of him who we get rid of him for and who he basically goes to signs with I know it's fair because he's a you know it's not fair because he's an English player so he's going to find a club but we've essentially hung ourselves into a very long deal and agreement with this kid because you most likely he's not going to have another big move after this if you think about it this is probably his one and only big move hence why we're probably playing the inflated players we're playing and giving him the crazy amounts of wages but I guess we we'll have to wait and see in this one. I don't want to break my head about it too much because it makes me super upset. And we're just going to have to hope and pray for the United fans that we get this sorted. But it's not looking good. It's not looking good at all. It's not looking good at all. Moving on from that one, we have this news courtesy of Enemy, which for me is a really interesting because I've been checking out some footage here and there from Glastonbury, seen some stuff online on Instagram. Um, the BBC here in the UK has a really good partnership with Glastonbury where they would live stream certain performances, show you certain clips. So you get a general good vibe of how the, or impression, sorry, of the vibe over there in the festival. And I have to be honest, like Glastonbury being the biggest or the, the, I think usually the sign of festival season starting, maybe that in Primavera. I have to be honest, like I haven't had any festival FOMO just yet. 
I know I'm probably speaking prematurely, but it's been quite nice to see that maybe the bug that I had once before of going to all these festivals is still there, don't get me wrong, but it's not as if now I'm dying to go. Do you know what I mean? Like, it looked fun, happy to see people having fun, but I'm not as, you know, I'm not suffering from FOMO as I did maybe in years gone by. And maybe, again, it comes with maturity. Maybe it's because I've got other things planned. I'm doing myself. I'm not really too sure, but it's been pretty confident to see for my own self that I'm not that stressed and worried about it as I was maybe in the past. Anyway, this headline, courtesy of Ed and Me, just shows you how fast festival season runs. And most likely, these festivals are probably planning their things. Like, what, two, three, four years maybe in advance, which is quite scary when you think about the amount of work that goes into these things to make it somewhat successful, which is why... If you have a festival that you support that's kind of like, you know, running on a tight budget, whatever it may be, and you cancel one year, maybe just, you know, think, consider, think twice about maybe refunding because I think these things are literally running on a shoe, you know, running on a, on a knife edge, if that, if that makes any sense. But the, the, the fact that they're confirming the dates goes to prove that, you know, this year gone by was super successful, especially if you think about the fact that this question has just gone past, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, is the first one since the pandemic. So there's been about two at least that will kind of push back. This is the first one back, which kind of explained the record number of people that are there and the non sort positive vibes. So it's been good to hear that. And also so far, I don't think I've heard any stories of deaths actually. Let me just double check, but I don't think I've heard any stories of deaths or people going and having some injuries over. Nothing's happened really. So, oh no. Okay, cool. Here we go. Um, <laughs> I just like to say I heard nothing, but Curse of Wales Online, it says, second death at Glastonbury after a man is found dead in a tent during the cleanup. Um, so, yeah. So, I guess there is, there, there's been second, there's been a second death here. Let's actually, there's, there's a story here, Curse of the Metro and one Curse of Sky. Let's actually quickly check this out before I read the enemy one. It says, Glastonbury's second festival death as crew member found unresponsive in tent. Okay, maybe it's not bad, it's bad to say this, but at least it's a crew member and not like a punter. So this is a bit different, but it's still a person. So I can't really say that. But anyway, let's continue. A Gastonbury crew member, Asian in his 40s, has been found dead in his tent. Avon and Somerset police are not treating the man's death as a park as suspicious and a report is being prepared as a coroner. So what did he do? Did he commit suicide or something? I don't really know. Don't get me wrong, past, you know, Meeting your end at Glastonbury is probably a good way to go out, to be fair. Um, officers were called on the site in Pilton, Somerset at 2.20pm on Tuesday and the man was found responsive in the tent where he was pronounced dead. God damn. Um, it comes after another man in his 40s died following a medical incident on a footpath, popularly known as the old railway line in the early hours of Sunday. Police said his death was not being treated as suspicious. Okay, so it looks like two people. One of them may have died from a freak accident. And the other one may have died from self-expiry by the sounds of it because they said they're not treated as suspicious at all. Police said the death was not being treated as suspicious and officers were carrying out inquiries. The festival ended on Monday, though the crew remained on site to clear up and return to fields ready our cows to graze on. Around 200,000 people usually attend the festival. So maybe not too bad. But anyway, regardless of that, enemy have confirmed that the question we have confirmed 2024 dates. It says here they confirm the dates. Keeping tradition, next year's festival will be taking place on the final weekend of June, from Wednesday, June 26th, all the way to Sunday, June 30th. The Somerset Best Festival is renowned and not just being biggest festival in the world, but also one of the hardest to get tickets for. So obviously they're going to be seeing you in 366 days. It says already they're planning for it during the clear up. So if you didn't go and you're eager to go, there's definitely a chance to go there already. And imagine they're already sorting out fucking headliners. They know who's going to be performing there one year already in advance. They probably have an idea who they're going to book for, for fucking 2025. Like festivals are a wild place to go. Like they're great for the punters. I think in general, they're amazing for the punters, especially like on-site ones, right? The ones you can bring your drinks with, put your tent up, hang out, meet new people, see loads of people for a cut price of what you pay. Because even, you know, even though it's pretty super expensive, you're still paying 300 quid a ticket and you're getting to see like hundreds of artists from around the world, some of the most popular ones. So you definitely get your money's worth. So, But then, you know, they have to do all the work and you just show up basically. They do all the fucking work, you just show up. So um, it makes some sense why there's so much planning that goes into it because of so many people they're dealing with, all the international acts and stuff. It becomes a big, 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 big thing. So big up them for handling that 
big up them for handling that and again RIP to whoever passed away because that sounds quite tragic I'm not going to lie pretty 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 tragic so this next news is actually pretty interesting for me because it made me do a bit of a deep dive into the whole world of celebrity liquors and whiskeys and tequilas and to kind of get an understanding of what that business is about because clearly that you know area of business is very lucrative because if you believe what you read online um diddy sean diddy combs one of the main reasons why he became a billionaire officially was because of his tie-ins with you know Ciroc and what he was doing there with that drink sponsorship and even someone like a rick ross as well his money has gone really crazy since he's done and done the whole belvedere thing so clearly the liquor business is very very lucrative and even for people like diddy and rick ross who've had you know decades and decades of fucking wealth and success when they do eventually launch a liquor it does go goo goo gaga which is why i'm surpri actually surprised thinking about it why someone like a rogan hasn't decided to dibble his toes into it maybe it makes sense for him because lifestyle wise he doesn't really talk about drinking liquor as much as everybody else you might have the odd glass of whiskey here and there when you're doing a fight companion or you might talk about drinking something when you went to eat a steak but it's not really part of his brand you don't really see him on his instagram posting you know whiskeys that he's tasting and wine you know whatever he's not really that into it as much as you probably would hope but you would imagine how dummy hard a joe rogan whiskey would go Oof. anyway all this to say this story courtesy of Hollywood reporter is interesting it says spirits giant diageo aims to cut ties with diddy after the mogul claims racial discrimination so it's been a pretty interesting turn of events so the story goes as this spirits giant diageo said it was severing partnership of 15 years i forgot how long he was been linked up with um diageo and Ciroc. 15 years with diddy come to help grow the company's then struggling Ciroc label as a brand ambassador and joint venture partner the move was in response to the music mogul suing the British alcoholic beverage maker in June for racial discrimination. <laughs> Imagine, Diddy's, Diddy's the same. This reminds me of that guy in Berlin that was crying that he couldn't get into a club and he sighed basically saying that they were basically being racist. And it was like, bruh, racist and, racist and homophobic. It's like, bro, if there's one place that you can assure you where most clubs are not going to be racist and homophobic. It's probably going to be fucking Berlin, but you know, everyone's got their personal experience. You can't begrudge it. It continues here. Claiming that Deirdre starved his vodka and tequila brands of promised investment and only marketed them to urban customers, consumers. So Deirdre made the announcement on Tuesday in a court filing seeking to dismiss the case or move it into arbitration. In a statement, Combs lawyer John Houston said Deirdre attempting to end this deal with Combs is like firing a whistleblower who calls out racism. <laughs> Diddy is like an activist now, right? Speaking up for the common man. Um, over the years he has repeatedly raised concerns as senior executives uttered racial insensitive comments and made biased decisions based on the point of view the IJ even acknowledged the problem by agreeing to by agreeing his contract to treat de leon the same way it treated other tequila brands de leon first approached combs in 2007 sorry the Adjo first approached combs in 2007 to handle marketing and promotion for ciroc an equal share joint venture he said in a suit that he sparked spectacular growth for the Ciroc and De Leon labels despite company refusing to uh, devote proper resources arguing that they were typecasted as black brands that have been targeted only to urban consumers I think that was pretty genius to be honest whoever decided to reach out to Diddy at that time in 2007 and basically bring him on board as a really high up level influencer it kind of worked for everybody because for Diddy, it got him a chance to introduce some new flavors in the market. Because I think the the deal or how they how the rumor goes is that the regular bottle of Ciroc, the blue one, was struggling. They get Diddy on board to promote it. Then he obviously pushes it and it becomes super big. He then wants to cut to the sales or the profits, whatever they do, the, the split, how they do it. They say, nah, not on this original one. Help us develop new original flavors and then we'll cut even on, on the sales and profits of that one. Hence why he started doing all the mangoes and pineapples and blackberries, all that stuff, right? Because those are things that he kind of, you know, helped to, um, help to build those flavors up from the ground up. But then over time, I'm guessing he wanted more and more of the pie and they didn't want to pay him more and more of it because, you know, they basically want to keep the money for themselves. It makes complete sense on both sides why they're arguing, to be fair. It continues. Diageo um, 
Diageo allegedly didn't comply with his obligations in the agreement by producing lower quantities, distributing in fewer outlets and limiting its marketing and promotion of Delion as compared to other brands according to the complaint. In 2014, Diageo acquired competing tequila brand Don Julio and committed to spending $400 million to grow the business. The company then spent $1 billion three years later to acquire Casamigos. Yo, that's a roster, isn't it? They got Don Julio and Casamigo. Following the acquisition of these comp- of these competing brands, Diageo effectively abandoned De Leon. Okay, cool. So he's arguing that because Diageo purchased Don Julio and Casamigos, they essentially dismissed or you know by by default they made it very clear that they were going to betting the horse or putting all their monies into those brands. So to be fair to to be fair to Diageo. That makes sense though, because these two brands are way more commercial, way more normy, general public than his, right? Or than Ciroc would be, maybe. Maybe it makes sense that they would push that because these are going to be, you know, pushed out to the general public. Um, anyway, the quote here, following its acquisition, the complaint, Deirdre effectively abandoned De Leon. Deirdre instead focused its market positioning efforts on brands like Casamigo, with founder George Clooney, Randy Gerber, and Mike Mandelman, Aviation Gin, which owner Ryan Reynolds, and he's got a gin called Aviation. That's a horrendous name. Um, and then Kettle One with Nollet Family as its preferred choices. Deirdre moving to this Mr. Suit, stressed that his contract um, with Combs doesn't require equal treatment of the brands but rather measured proportionate treatment and support of the Delion brands while taking into account a variety of differences among the brands according to the court filings. The company said the statement on Tuesday that Combs was repeatedly under, undermined their partnership and threatened to publicly defame Diageo if they did not meet his unfair <laughs> reasonable financial demands. We tried for years to salvage the broken relationship with Mr. Combs, says the company. We funded the purchase of Delion for the joint venture and proceeded to invest more than 100 million to grow the brand. Despite having made nearly a million dollars, sorry, despite having made nearly a billion dollars over the course of the last 15 years of relationship, Mr. Combs contributed a total of 1,000 only and refused to honor his commitments. So they're basically saying he did it over to his heart to deal. I can't, that must be the most someone's ever made from like an influencer marketing campaign thing, right? 15 years, over a billion. Who's who's probably done more than that? Do, do, do you think the collections have probably done more than that? I'm not really too sure. That's an insane amount of money to make over 15 years. You don't actually own the brand. You're essentially like a, you know, an overinflated, um, you know, essentially influencer and that's what you get. That shows you the amount of money that's involved in liquors. And also it shows you why this desperation suit that did his fighting, I can understand why, because he wants to settle out of court and you're still going to end up with a few million. So it makes complete sense. So for me, when it comes to the story, what really sticks out is there's clearly, I think, on Diddy's side, an inability to kind of work with these people, with these kind of, I don't know, what would you call them, these corporations in a somewhat um, amicable way. Because I feel like they could have rescued this solution. This didn't need to go this far. And I feel like the racial discrimination thing is bullshit. Because you're in a relationship with these guys for 15 years. It's only now you say something about racial discrimination around the same time that you have been beef with them because they didn't push your tequila brand. I just think this is a clearly one of those misunderstandings in business that happen all the time. They could have dealt with this easily behind closed doors and made it work. But instead, as soon as you brought it into the public and you just besmirched their name, it doesn't surprise me that the AGO will go out of their way to make sure that they cut ties of him so that it doesn't represent them anymore. That makes complete sense to me. I'm not really too shocked about that. But I just think in all, this also goes to prove that a lot of these guys, I don't know what it is, but they get way too much. What's it? No, it's like it kind of feels like entitlement, because for for what we've been reading so far, the Adjo is one that puts most of their capital and takes most of the risk for launching products. They're the ones that are testing it, manufacturing it, producing whatever they're doing. Right? They're investing a lot to get those things made and pushed out there. And more than likely, they've already got an infrastructure. They've got a business that already works. You can kind of plug and play. So if that's the case, you kind of have to treat the relationship a bit differently than if it was just a straight up, you know, influence on influencer type of thing. Clearly one person is the manufacturer type of deal and then, you know, you split it accordingly. But I think the idea that they own it too is a bit wild. Do you know what I mean? Like it's definitely, 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 definitely a bit wild. It definitely comes off of being titled. 
But it's also funny for me from Diddy's side of things because he's always been accused of somebody that does bad business. He's always had this kind of smart against his name, especially if you listen to someone like a Mace or some other folks out there. You've had some very bad dealings with him in the record industry. You'd think if, if you're that guy and you're known to be a bit of a scammer, you're known to be a bit of a grifter, you're known to be a bit of a, you know, allegedly be a bit of a charlatan or whatever it may be, you have to be okay with sometimes it coming back and biting in your ass. If you sometimes scam people allegedly and you sometimes get away with it, you have to also be, you know, not be happy with it, but be respectful and be like, you know what? Thanks, universe, for that reminder. Cheers. Thanks for that little reminder. Because it could have been far worse than this, do you know what I mean? So the fact that it's only ending the way it's ending now, this is is what it is. But again, like I said, it always it also goes to prove how much money is really involved in this liquor industry because clearly it's a lot to the point where Diddy is essentially, I feel like, lying or exaggerating what exactly happened behind closed doors at Diageo, claiming it's racism in order for him to kind of win some money and shit. But again, you know, he could have, uh, he could have, uh, he could have avoided all this if he would have done what most people should do in these kind of situations. You get hired by Diageo to basically spearhead the relaunch of Ciroc or to basically revive it. You do your job diligently. Over 15 years, you make a billion dollars. You should be taking that money and making your own fucking Casamigos. You don't need them to develop it for you. And the fact that he did do it shows that there's a reliance too much on these guys to just go into places and do plug and play deals or plug, you know, insert themselves in deals without doing much to kind of get involved in them and then hoping for the maximum amount of return. I don't think that's fair on the person you're, work, you're working with partnership wise. It doesn't really make much sense to me in that regard. So maybe this is a lesson learned in that regard in terms of like betting on yourself ridiculously well and investing your money on yourself in that way. But I really am eager to see how this plays out because it feels like Diddy's trying to get himself a nice little payday off of the back of this. Um, and it'll be nice actually if he does end up, you know, even if it does end up not going anywhere, he gets thrown out. I would actually like to see him actually launch his own thing from the ground up invest his own money and go that way and see what happens there because if the guy was able to generate 15 nearly a billion in 15 years just representing Ciroc making it really desirable to a point where I purchased it a few times only on the shelf of him I'd love to see what he could do with his own brand from the ground up I'll be curious to see from that but again let's see if that works out let's see if that one works out next we have to talk about this as well courtesy of AP News this I'm pretty surprised by, to be honest. I'm not really sure what I expected when it comes to Travis Scott um, criminal charges for the whole Astro World thing and the fact that I think nearly 10 kids died or something. I'm not sure what I expected, but I don't think I expected a complete dismissal and no charges whatsoever is going to be facing. So the headline here, courtesy AP News says, rapper Travis Scott will not face criminal charges in deadly crowd surge at Texas Festival, which again is fairly obvious because if you've been paying attention you would have seen Travis being way more visible you know with the Utopia promotion just being about being mixy doing loads of taking loads of pictures traveling around the world so clearly his team had an idea that this would be the case and he was decided to kind of prep and start promoting his album or he was hoping for the best anyway and decided to promote his album whilst there wasn't any negative heat on him who knows but I got a feeling his counsel his team knew this is going to be the case so it says here a Texas grand jury declined to indict rapper Travis Scott in a criminal investigation of a deadly crowd surge in 2021. This obviously, I feel like, is also a benefit of like doing all those turkey runs, having the key to the city, doing loads of charity work for your fucking, you know, for your state. This is what happens in the end. You get rewarded sometimes. All those things that you don't think you should be doing it are a waste of time. When you get in trouble, this is where it kind of helps because you have some people probably fighting your fight you don't even know who are kind of backing you up and making sure that you get the decision that you need. So it says here, um, the criminal investigation of a deadly crowd surge in 2021 Astro World Festival, was that just yesterday, where some spectators was packed so tightly they could not move their arms or even breathe. This, his attorney and prosecutor said on Thursday, lawyer Kent Schaefer confirmed that the Harris County Grand Jury had met and decided not to indict um, this client of any criminal charges stemming from the concert. He never encouraged people to do anything that resulted in other people getting hurt. Um, yeah, that's a bit of a lie and a bit of semantics, but we let it run. It's a great relief, he said. 
the the attorney circumstances of the deaths limited what charges prosecutors were able to present to the jury eliminating potential counts such as murder manslaughter and criminal negligence homicide said alicia carvey an assistant district attorney of the harris county the left prosecutors that prosecutor sorry to focus on possible cults um, counts of endangering child can endangering a child in connection with the death of two youngest concert girls aged nine and fourteen. The grand jury found that no crime did occur. That was no single individual who criminally responsible. Yeah, but that's a thing I'm not really too sure about because no one's saying it was all Travis's fault, but he definitely didn't help things. He was inciting them to rage and to riot and go crazy. So they did exactly what he said they did, and at no point did he try to settle them down. That's a real funny style part for me. Roughly 300 people were injured um, on the scene and 25 were taken to hospital. Houston police and federal officials have been investigating whether Scott concert promoter Live Nation and others um, were sufficiently put safety measures in place. During a news conference on Thursday afternoon after the jury decision, police presented various details of the investigation, including a time and events during the Scott's performance. The location of the concert was said to be on but police chief Troy Fina, sorry, um, declined to say that the overall conclusion of the agency um, investigation was whether the police had been hot stopped um, the concert fewer. Finally, sorry, but police chief uh, Troy Fina declined to say what the overall conclusion of the agency's investigation was or whether the police should have stopped the concert sooner. Fina said that the police planned to make a more than 1,000 page report on the case um, public so people can read through the information from the investigators reviewed okay that's pretty fair um the chief of police is not going to get up here and point fingers at anybody i respect the grand jury's decision i simply want people to read the offense report and read the entire investigation and everybody will see very 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 complicated no it's i don't doubt it's complicated i'm just surprised he's not going to face any charges zero that there has to be some culpability to like sending your fans into a crazy frenzy of that I'm so much so they want to riot and go crazy you have to kind of be responsible for that i feel like just a little bit but you know maybe they don't feel that way but travis is not responsible they said criminal charges against him will not um, ease their pain the grand jury declined to indict five other people including festival manager brent silberstein a attorney for silberstein did not immediately reply more than 500 lawsuits have been fired of the death some have since been resettled Kevin Hayes, a Houston attorney whose firm is representing hundreds of people at the injured concert, said he's disappointed by the grand jury, but civil cases will continue. So this isn't the end of it, obviously. It's going to get probably worse before it gets better for Travis, but in the short term, if he wants to promote Utopia, sorry, he wants to go on tour, I think there's a tour planned, I saw somewhere like in November or something. So it makes it in November? I don't know, I'm not too sure when it was, but I saw something about a tour. So clearly there's a whole rollout planned about this album and it makes sense why he's going to be you know happy and hyped about this because essentially he can somewhat get his life back together and hope to kind of put his stuff behind him but i'm generally surprised he didn't get even one charge not even one nothing stuck to him at all in the slightest so i guess you have to respect that guy's gangster isn't it? i guess you have to respect his guy's gangster because jesus christos i would have folded so quickly it's not even funny it's not even funny I'll tell you that much. I'll tell you that for free. I'll tell you that for absolutely free. I would have folded like an absolute lawn chair and you can't even tell me anything different about that one. Moving on from that, we've got some tragic news again revealing here, courtesy of BBC. It says a Titanic sub photo showed a wreckage being brought up ashore. So most of you have known the the the, the, the submersible that went deep, 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 deep into the ocean to go and check out the wreckage of the Titanic, unfortunately came into some trouble. And most likely, according to the experts online, it probably ex imploded instead of exploded, which is horrible and sad. But according to people online, it probably would have happened in three milliseconds or something so the people inside probably wouldn't have felt anything and they would have gone out somewhat painless but the sadness for the families associated with these guys who were in that submarine is unfamable i don't know what they're going through right now and how they're going to put it into words but it's just also a bit tragic that now we're seeing at the final end of this whole saga where we're seeing bits of the submarine itself being pulled out from the fucking ocean and then investigate, I'm assuming, to really get down to the bottom of what actually happened. So this is Coach of BBC. 
Um, let's see here. It says parts of the Taurus submersible that imploded on a deep dive of the Titanic, killing the five people, has been seen for the first time since the incident. Metal wreckage from the Titan sub was unloaded from the Horizon Arctic um, ship in St. John's, Canada on Wednesday. Photographs showed new metals from the sub carried in tarps. U.S. Coast Guard officials have said a submersible landing frame and rear cover had been found among the debris. All five people on board the vessel died on 18th of June after it imploded about 19 minutes into their dive. The funny thing is for me when it comes to this sort of stuff is like there was clearly an objective put out there by the media or the powers that be to make sure the public didn't know that most likely all the experts were in agreement or in agreement that the submersible had exploded or the guys in there were dead since like Monday or something they had that you know it was kind of trending but by midweek but people in the industry were saying that the family were already all gone by flipping Monday which is pretty nuts to think of a prediction but unfortunately it's been proven somewhat right to be honest um, it continue here. It says U.S. Coast Guard officials have said the submersible landing frame and rear was found around the debris. All five people on the boat um, were imploded or died. Look at that, man! Jesus Christ! Look at the houses destroyed as well. Wow! Um, debris as well. There more debris, more debris, more debris. But yeah, big up Conor McGregor for coming in and doing what he does best. But Jesus, man, the debris on those guys' head is absolutely wild. Not gonna lie. It actually quickly plays before I move on. Oops, not dashing in replay. It's annoying. But anyway, yeah. Um, I repeat to the people who pass away in that sub. Hopefully, a lesson learned for everybody inclu involved, even in the small, like, startup, backyard, do it myself, kick car type of vibe people. You know, some safety precautions in place, some, you know, fail safe, you know, for, you know, whatever they called um fail safe flipping exits that you can take and whatever maybe should be placed there in my humble opinion but again you know when it comes to these sort of things i don't really know much i don't really know much this is a pretty interesting one to me because i feel like i haven't stopped using spotify over the last few years especially since my joe rogan podcast um, consumption has gone down i've mainly been using apple music for my daily music enjoyment but i still have a spotify account that i'm paying for which is pretty dumb but hey it is what it is for the most part what i tended to do in the past i used to usually split my indie alternative maybe electronic music dance music slash stuff on spotify and then i'll have all my other shit rap hip-hop all that malarkey r&b on my apple music the stuff i listen to like on you know more of a daily basis but the other stuff i listen to also like the metal and all that malarkey would also be on spotify but over time i got bored of switching in between and also to be honest the sound on spotify is dead compared to apple music like i always feel like they've kind of capped it at a certain level um it kind of doesn't sound like it's as high a volume as it could be on apple music which makes this new feature even more interesting to be completely honest so it's a courtesy of high beast it says Spotify have rumored to launch a super premium um, subscription band later this year. It says Spotify is rumored to be launching a new expensive and more expensive sorry, subscription. Um, this new subscription band is titled to premium uh, the service and plans to offer a hi-fi audio and expanded audio book access. However, despite the Spotify's announcement to introduce looseless hi-fi audio under the Spotify Connect and umbrella of February 2021, the feature has yet to become available. Actually, he's talking about audio books. One thing I've noticed too, I used to sometimes download audio books via like you know illegal means i never purchased them which is why i was tearing through so many fucking audiobooks a few years ago but i guess over time i kind of got put off by doing it because the basically the apple itunes um app has been updated to the point where now you can't easily drag and drop um books on there it's kind of hard to do to get an, an Apple and sorry to get an audio book on your phone is kind of difficult. You could just do it through an audio file manager thing because there's a good file manager on the iPhone. But I kind of wanted to show up on the audio book app that you normally have, right? So you can get a time to like know where you stopped it. Um, you can mark stuff. You can mark it to complete. I don't know. It's just a nice feature to have. But you can't do it as easily now on the new iTunes or whatever it's called. I think the app now is called Music or something, right? It's not even iTunes anymore. So that makes it a little bit difficult is it called music i think it's like a music app yeah that's it. it's just called music it's not even itunes anymore so that makes it hard to make that service viable 
So, but I don't know. Do people actually use audiobooks for Spotify? That's wild. Anyway, it continues here. It says, as per Bloomberg, Spotify has now um, new plans to add an expanded selection of audiobooks rather than sell titles individually. Expanded selection? What does that even mean? Rather than sell them individually. While premium members of the streaming service will have access to this number, specific number of free hours of titles each month. Okay, cool. I get what they mean. So, if you've got the premium you can get whatever and if you've got the other ones you can only get a select few cool commenting on the news plan gustav sodersom um told the verge that hi-fi was still underway and stated that when spotify announced introduction the industry changed to a bunch of reasons we are going to do it he said but we're going to do it in a way where it makes sense for us and our listeners the industry changed and we had to adapt while no official release date for the new spotify feature has been announced yet supreme service was expected to launch in u.s non-u.s countries first so you're probably going to get a service where you can have really high maximum volume on your fucking Spotify sometime later this year to justify them paying, you know, to justify them trying to charge you more money for it. I don't think that's enough, to be fair. I don't know about you guys, but I've, I don't think it's enough. I think there's plenty of people out there who put up with listening to a few ads here and there if it means they don't have to spend 10 to 15 to 20 pounds per month for a subscription service that isn't the greatest. And for some reason, especially you know in my part of london the coverage for my mobile you know for my fucking cellular network isn't the greatest either so even if you are trying to stream stuff over air you're not trying to download things to save memory in your actual phone itself it's not easy to always connect on these things so i think there's a growing contingent a growing contingency of people out there who'd rather just you know have stuff downloaded or have a dedicated you know music player like i'm thinking of i'm actually legitimately thinking of going back and buying a fucking you know an an ipod the old ones with the rotating click wheel and just using that as a flipping um music player thing and if you need be i think there are little dongles you can buy online they're not the greatest um but they do work where you can essentially turn any um device into the wireless bluetooth connecting type of thing so you can plug like a little you know headphone adapter jack with bluetooth and connectivity on it and then have that connect to your bluetooth speakers you know noise cancelling headphones whatever it may be but that might be an option because most of these services aren't really worth it in the long run really they're kind of a bit shit even apple music which i love and use dearly it's not usually the greatest listening experience or just kind of you know using experience on a day-to-day basis so i'm not really sure if just you know adding another band and saying you can get higher fucking quality audio is really going to entice the regular consumer who just wants to get the latest newest freshest music as soon as possible they don't probably care about as audio quality as much as probably i do and maybe you do if you're a geek in this thing like i am but hey we have to wait and see when that does launch we have to wait and see when that does eventually launch next on the list here let's talk about this actually i thought this is absolutely hilarious so this is courtesy of bbc and it's really interesting because um for the most part i feel like th- there's a really small group well, not a small group but there's a subsect of social media especially mum's social media that has never let this lady forget her earlier comments that she made i think during maybe the p- the peak of the pandemic when everyone was struggling and really down bad and um, molly may one of the contestants from love island who has now become a businesswoman in herself in her own right and influencer and stuff she decided to go on this podcast and basically say hey we all have the same 24 hours to do what the hell we want with our careers and whatnot um use your time wisely work hard and you can make your you know you could get here where i am as well right that kind of idea that whole you know um pull yourself up by a bootstrap sort of mentality but to give her some ply, to give her some kind of cope or to give her some type of rope, if you listen to an entire interview, you would see in context, they were talking in generality about the sacrifices that she's made in her career to be as successful as she is. Because if I'm not mistaken, this Molly Mae Hay girl is like anywhere between like, I'm assuming 21 to 25. She's incredibly young, but incredibly successful despite her age. And I think she was saying in the interview something along the lines of, hey, I've had to give up on all the things people my age do and enjoy, like friends going out, getting fucked up and getting drunk, blah, 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 holidays all the time. I've given it all up to just focus on work. And this is why I'm that successful. That's kind of what I think she was getting at without getting into her own privilege and being white and looking the way she does. You know, forget all that stuff, right? I think that's what she was mostly going at. But obviously when she said it, it came out mad internet reacted you know savagely and she essentially hasn't been the same since perception wise online 
And this update is hilarious because the same person who said the girl had the same in 24 hours is now stepping down from her role as Pretty Little Thing, if I'm not mistaken, creative director, which was a big deal at the time. It's still a big deal now, but the fact that this girl who essentially started off as an influencer doing hauls and stuff and try-ons and look what I bought, look what they sent me, suddenly got to a position where the brand itself um, were hiring her to kind of come in and help craft you know the vision for the brand helped to contribute to some ideas some fits some colors whatever it may be was a real big kind of come up so the fact that she's had to quit that to focus on being a mum full time goes to show just how difficult it is to be a single mother and just how difficult it is to balance that with obviously working day to day and that all the kind of you know backlash she was getting from people online was some of it was you know over the top but most of it was coming from a real good place because a lot of those mums were saying hey I'm the same as you. I have all these entrepreneurial ideas. I'm as ambitious as you are. But sometimes if you have a legitimate human to look after, sometimes all those things go to the wayside. You just have to focus on that child until they're fucking 18. And then maybe you might start your career. And even then it's not a fucking guarantee. So this is literally a um, manifestation of this. So it says as follows. The Love Island star Molly May Hay, Molly May Hoog or Hoog, Haug, I'm assuming his personal name is like that, has said that she's stepping down from her role as creative director of fashion brand Pretty Little Thing after less than two years to focus on her being a mum. The influencer took on the reportedly big money role in August 2021 before joining, before going, uh, giving birth earlier this year. Like I said before, I think a lot of the backlash she got was a bit, little bit overblown, but I think a lot of it came around the time that we were all struggling, you know, as regular mega the people everyone was kind of like you know maybe getting fired maybe the dumbing down the roles working from home just struggling and then you got these people who are making crazy amounts of money from you know wearing shitty things and you know whatever not doing the you know, most hardest things in the world and then they're also telling you that you're not working hard enough if you want to be a successful woman, you need to work even harder despite all the things that you have to look after day to day that make it difficult to do that in the first place so i think that's probably why people were more angry than as opposed to what she actually said the circumstances around it were pretty bleak for everybody but anyway it continues she said while everything is going incredibly work-wise she went to commit fully to raising her daughter the 24 year old will continue to work as a brand ambassador for the company of course you can't you can't completely cut off the money speaking on a youtube channel haig said who met the partner boxer tommy fury on an itv dating show said that she would forever have the most insane relationship with her family a pretty little thing i'm still working with them and doing collections and edits but i have actually decided to step down as creative director role over the last few weeks i realized that i'm only going to get this time once for my firstborn child and i'm only going to get bambi being four months old once and i feel like i have to try to rearrange my life a little bit and lose some commitments that i didn't have i did have which i agree with i think if you're in a position that she is where you can essentially make your own hours and do what you want it's a real disservice to your family and to yourself if you don't take advantage of it and make it work for you whereas you know you can essentially spend more time with your kid at home spend more time with your family with your partner or whatever maybe you should actually do that if you can because there's kind of there's going to come a point you would imagine you know when your star kind of dwindles and you're not as famous as big as you once were maybe you are not as demand as you once were where the thing kind of changes you don't have the ability to decide what you do when you do it you kind of have to you know do things based on what people want you to do so if you can do it now why not take advantage of it but again it's also proof of how difficult it is to raise children right because this girl has the means to have as much help as she can she can hire as many filipino mexican african flipping child minors as she wants these aunties to come in and basically take a lot of stress off her hands maybe some family could come in also but you could pay them if you want to but all those are, you know abilities and tools to your arsenal it's still difficult to do and you would also imagine on top of that think about this this role that she does a pretty little thing most likely she's got a pretty good rep over there i'm assuming no pun intended she probably well liked at the point where they're still willing to keep her on as ambassador there's probably an arrangement they could have easily made where she could have done an easy kind of you know very reduced hour type of role and kept the title or just phoned it in so it does say a lot about the person herself that she would voluntarily step down and not just take the money from doing nothing and it also says a lot about the relationship that she has with those people 
that they will be willing to keep us an ambassador but also it shows you quite clearly that even with all the money in the world all the access and whatever you want even with a job that you can essentially do it from anywhere in the world you don't have to be in the office all the time the stresses and the stresses and strains of raising a child is still really really extensive it continues here it says she went on to say that she loved being the creative director of plt more than anything stressed that there'd been no drama and nothing bad as has going on it was simply that it was an amazing chapter of her life and naturally come to an end i'm a mum now and i never really gave myself maternity leave and i got straight back into work instantly because my work is my phone and showing my life is my work the last thing i would want to be in this role that i can't fulfill right now in this moment her departure comes two months after long-standing preloading fan that umar kamai left the boho group to pursue new opportunities so it's pretty cool but again if i'm not mistaken that salary if i saw online was like something like four hundred thousand a month or something which is insane i don't you know you're hearing like only nowadays are you seeing like with content creation social media stuff you're hearing of people getting what you would get in a salary per year they're getting it per month that's when you know the money online in marketing and media and all that stuff and content is crazy so she allegedly she was getting that kind of money um per month but still it wasn't enough to, of a pool to kind of get her to kind of phone it in and just kind of you know um do the bare minimum and collect checks because clearly spending time with a kid and growing that kid up is probably way 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 more important um to flip and make that flip and make sense so big up her in general but again it is quite funny to see that all that kind of 24 hour chat has kind of gone out the window um and there's going to be a certain segment unfortunately of social media that's never going to actually forgive her for that comment because i feel like you know maybe mums online feel like there's like a sisterhood that connects them all together motherhood that connects them all together of going through that struggle they know how painful it is and even if you've got money you know you kind of recognize the pain and the struggle of everybody so she maybe spoke down on them too soon and they never forgot given her for it uh, but i don't think she was pregnant at the time maybe she was i'm not sure at the time she was pregnant when she made that comment but it also goes to show that you can there's two ways to do it you can do it where you actually raise your kid yourself or you can do it in a way where like the Kardashians do where you don't really care about raising the kid yourself you have people to help you but then you're still kind of like there right you you kind of act as like the creative director of your family essentially you have people running the show for you day to day but you're still there to kind of oversee give the final word on what not or what needs to go down that maybe is another way to kind of do it but if you actually want to be hands-on with your child and raise them then unfortunately you probably do have to take a step back especially if you have the ability to and devote more time to them if possible but big up molly may regardless takes a lot of balls to do that especially knowing what the negative backup she's probably going to get and again you know hopefully it goes well for her in the future hopefully it does go well yeah so this is a courtesy of the instagram account called techno.germany that i recently stumbled across on the fuck yeah so this is courtesy of the instagram account called techno.germany that i recently stumbled across um and it's a fairly interesting one because essentially it posts loads of random clips of all the i don't know the people now in the techno scene or adjacent tiktok techno scene that are pushing things really popular and whatnot and doing the most on the social media side of things and it collects it all into one place so a lot of the conversations that you may hear or see of people having on techno twitter probably stem from some of the clips that you may see featured on here but from a solely punter's selfish point of view it's pretty good because it gives you an idea of what the different scenes are like across germany not just in berlin and you sometimes get a heads up on some festivals or some clubs that you probably never heard of before and maybe it might you know you know make you interested to go and check them out because it has done for me in the past the same sort of thing but i was browsing through this seeing some clips whatever and i stumbled across this particular clip of i hate models playing somewhere in a festival in some venue somewhere and the comments were interesting to me this is the clip here i think this one here in the middle um, there was a lot of comments here about I hate models being representation being representative of toxic masculinity, which I feel like is a real, real, real stretch when you consider what the guy looks like, when you consider the music that he plays, consider the way he dances. Like it's interesting that people would say that, and I think a lot of it probably stems from the fact that he actually enjoys himself. He's behind the booth having a blast, really going crazy. The particular brand of techno he plays isn't for me, but if you go through and listen or read accounts of people going, you know, watching his mixes or people reviewing club nights that he's played at, a lot of people say 
that are weirdly enough i hear models was a lot of people's introduction to techno overall the same way like maybe you know those corny um possession parties that maybe you know died um at the right time but the, you know there's a period of time where possession was like running it on social media in terms of like pushing that new kind of super fast hardcore industrial type of sound um even though it's not the greatest music, what it did for, for the most part, I think for the greater economy, for the greater, I wouldn't say economy, but for the greater scene, what it does, I think hopefully, is that it would introduce a lot of kids to the scene and get them to kind of dig a bit deeper and find out things that they're actually interested in. So you kind of come in, you know, liking cheesy, horrible stuff. And then over time, through digging and curiosity, you maybe discover some cooler, more interesting things that you might want to explore going forward. So they basically serve their purpose in that they introduce you to a subculture and a scene that you probably wouldn't have been familiar with so i think i hear models as the same sort of thing and i think as just a performer as a dj as an artist and stuff it's just cool and just fun and refreshing to see somebody like him who's clearly having fun behind the booth whether he's the actor out of his mind whether he's just performing for the sake of it i don't give a fuck the fact that him the fact the likes of you know patrick mason are behind the booth actually having a great time for me is always going to be way more up there rated than people just standing behind the booth acting like they don't want to be there being too cool for school you know taking themselves way too seriously and all that stuff it's just dead because for me anyway i think one of the reasons why i got involved in the scene is because i used to go to raves a lot and i still do right i would call myself a quote-unquote raver more so i'd call myself a dj or party promoter all those kind of things but usually over time of getting involved in the scene what ends up happening is that you end up wanting to get more involved you end up maybe wanting to throw your own parties you end up maybe wanting to produce wanting to make music wanting to dj and it all stems from being an avid person that goes out a lot and wants to rave and get flipping naughty that's what usually happens to most people that decide to kind of dabble in the flipping dark arts of fucking raving and shit so these guys are representative of how we all were on the dance floor we were all going crazy all doing whatever and then now that they're on the flipping now that they're behind the booth on the these big stages at these big events are doing the same thing so i can't really understand why that would be toxic in my opinion but i'll play a bit of the clip anyway so you can see what i mean but this is i hate models um this is the caption says endless energy at the latest waves open air um top 10 moments include i hate models trim patrick mason kaiva armin john armin john uh back to back with rico heating up the dance floor in hanover let's play a bit of it now hopefully it plays don't get me wrong it's just you know it's what you can see and what you can hear there's not definitely not my style definitely not something that i'll be into but if you scroll down and check some of the comments even the first one here like i feel like patrick mason is trying testing us to see how far he can take pranking techno at this point and i'm kind of here for it <laughs> pranking what does that even mean um techno festivals and there's neither techno tracks in the six seven clips here um, another person says that Tim track take me back to Waven Sphere. Patrick Mason only annoying me now. Changed my mind again. I don't understand this because I think the next clip shows him actually. Uh, let's just go. actually let's show. I'll show you the next clip. I think there's the next clip here that actually shows Patrick Mason. <laughs> So yeah, I'm surprised that could be an, that could be deemed as, as annoying. To be completely fair, like I don't I don't really know what what the what the kind of explanation for this stuff is. I just think maybe overall, it's just a case of most people in the scene don't like this type of expression, and I think it's fairly evident now because at first I was thinking maybe this is like 
this is a little bit like um a, a weird kind of like you know subtle dog whistling racism thing but actually this is a best example of the fact that it isn't because clearly um these fans on this particular page any in particular are not a fans of the way you know i hate models dances behind the booth and the way that patrick mason carries himself when he's dancing in front of the booth and on top of the booth they just don't like it at all so it goes to show that maybe um the appetite for that level of performance that level of artistry behind the booth isn't encouraged or welcomed by a certain demographic of people that listen to this type of music which again i feel like is really unfortunate because i feel like we all start off being i hate models we all start off being patrick mason on the dance floor that's how we get interested in it so i would imagine you would like to see yourself reflected behind the booth by having people that look like they're enjoying themselves more so than just people that are standing there stiff like flipping robots not looking like they're having a good time maybe that's just me i'm not really sure but i would prefer to see that but clearly the guys there aren't feeling that they're not liking it and the comments around the other pages or the other people who are performing and look a little bit more stiff if you just quickly scroll by they clearly Clearly, I'm enjoying those a bit more. There's another clip here, obviously, of I Hit Models. Let's play this one also and see what this sounds like. I'm curious to see what they thought about this also. I said, don't get me wrong, it's not for me, but clearly, as you can see, the people in the crowd, they're absolutely loving it. They're going fucking crazy. They can't have enough of it. So sometimes you wonder, like, does all this commentary online matter? It clearly does to some extent because this page is really popular. They've got like, you know, I don't know, what is it, over 100,000? No, yeah, nearly a million. Got over half a million flipping followers, 675 followers on Instagram. That's not, you know what I mean? That's not by hook or chance. Clearly, they've got a good, you know, fan base. There are people that like what they do and it resonates with them um, and whatnot. But everything else, they're not really too big fans of. Let's see, there's another clip here of Patrick Mason also I want to play here. Um, I don't know, maybe because I've I've kind of, you know, had some brief interaction with the guy on DMs here and there. But I'm a fan of the Patrick Mason guy. It's refreshing to have somebody like this in techno. Really, I feel like he's a bit of a throwback in the sense that maybe in the late 90s, early 2000s, he would have been even bigger than what he is now as an artist and everything overall because he's kind of got that charisma and showmanship behind the booth. But I'm just surprised nowadays, considering how main character everybody is, how dramatic everybody is, how self absorbed everybody is, I'm surprised more people don't connect with him. They don't see themselves more in him than they would. Instead, they just find it obnoxious and annoying, which is strange because he can still mix really well, personally. I still think so. Technically, he's still a good mixer. You may not like his track selections, but I think there's no way he you rarely hear him clanging you know as much as some of these other guys are out there some of the stuff you might play might not be to your taste might be a bit cheesy might be a bit reductive but it's still fairly decent and he's clearly a very good performer in the stage so let's see this other clip also and see what they say here or i will just see what it looks like Anyway, he's, he's smashing it, man. I think they're smashing it. I don't get why people like, get upset, really. Take a chill pill, relax, let people enjoy themselves. Um, and if anything, you know, there's there's the opposite of this out there that exists that just has their head down, looking completely moody, not really having a good time. They do exist out there. So if you want to see those type of people play, then you know where you can go to see that type of thing. And then I guess the last one that shows a clip of him is this particular one of flipping them. I hate models. This one, how he's dancing. So you can see some of the reason why some people don't like the way he skanks 
let's see this one actually this is this is what is probably one of the ones that was making people really upset on the timeline this is courtesy of another account called sound of techno all one word on instagram it says i hate models doing the famous two-step at the isle of summer festival somebody here straight away 371 likes this guy absolutely sucks <laughs> <laughs> why are people hating him why is he wearing a mask though um guys dancing harder than anyone in the crowd no drug in the crowd can let me enjoy this give give bro some food first or oh, look at this guy verified hating you know that's not good you shouldn't be verified and hating why is he wearing a mask why is the mask outside Take, don't check drugs like they, they legitimately hate this dude which is interesting because i feel like he's fairly inoffensive looks like he's having a whale of a time and for the most part his productions are fairly decent not my vibe but i get how people will like it anyway let's play the clip enough talking from me and let's see what it's saying oh, I never me, baby. <laughs> that's good I don't, I, I don't mind it personally but i think it's fucking vibes that skank is fucking incredible with the legs that's fucking good that's the thing though if you've actually been to a festival you'd know how much this actually adds to your experience that's something people don't really realize when you're actually out there in the baking sun you're tripping balls you're coming down you're feeling a little bit lethargic sometimes having somebody just next to you going for it can lift your mood sometimes seeing the dj behind the booth going crazy can lift your mood like it all kind of adds to it so this whole performance is actually part of it do you know what i mean especially if you're booking somebody like this you're getting way more of your money's worth booking him than booking somebody else i won't mention who's just standing there looking fucking comatose at least he's having a good time. It's going to rub off on the crowd. It's going to be good vibes. You're going to get lots of good content out of it. Like this festival, right? Called Isle of Sound Summer. They've got all these clips people are going to be sharing online about it. It all kind of works out to its end, to be honest. I think, I don't know. Some of it might be jealousy. Some of it might just be pure hatred. People like to see people just standing there straight. And that might be the way to go about things. But I think nowadays, considering how the scene is changing, the importance of social media, different influences, showmanship, the comp how competitive it is to be a DJ out there, maybe part of this is you know part of the game it's the same way how you got ufc fighters turning into wwe you know wrestlers and stuff how they promo and and how they kind of call out certain fighters maybe part of the update and the evolution of the game is that you kind of have to be a bit performative behind the booth more so than you would do normally because you know that could help you go viral and maybe increase your profile online and stuff it kind of is what it is really in that respect and then to end we got the clip here of that guy who's one of the one half of that podcast i listened to called that's techno team recommend you check it out on youtube um who's now become famous just for raving which is pretty cool i think in some respects um to just be well known for being somebody that has a good time outside who's a good vibe to the point where now he's door picking and selecting at certain clubs in berlin which is pretty cool and i think he's he's from the uk as well which is amazing so he, he moved out there and now he's become a bit of a big dog out there from just you know dressing up looking cool and dancing really you know really intensely in the kind of techno viking way with this beret and what looks like a sports bra some short shorts and shit and having a whale of a time his life his um his name on instagram is life underscore by kazen underscore no yeah, life underscore by underscore kazen yeah on instagram you can find him on there but this is an interesting one as well i think this is taken from melt festival as well let's see him dancing and skanking <laughs> Like I said, I don't mind it, man. I'm I'm all for change. I'm all for evolution. I just think the scene is going where it's going. If you're out there still moody, still upset that it's not the way it used to be and there isn't a hundred thousand RA editors or journalistic kids or people that are really analysing the music in a really analytical way and the dance as it was once before, that's your shame. It, it kind of is what it is. Maybe it's a responsibility of the clubs themselves to cultivate the rooms and make sure you don't have too many annoying people in the spaces, but it's kind of going the way it's going um, and you have to just adapt or die basically um you can still carve out little spaces for yourself that are a little bit protected from the horrors of everyday people out there but for the most part it's going the way it's going um either you evolve with it or you die either you evolve with it 
or you die. And then we've got some other news here, courtesy of RA, regarding this London open air venue called Silverworks Island, um, formerly known as Dockyards, launching this weekend. So I wonder what happens with these type of things. I wonder if it's a thing where these licenses are always open, because I guess, you know, we've got 14 days of scorching summer coming up in July. So I wonder if they always had this kind of in the back burner, ready to go. Or because if it's summer and there's loads of money to be made, the council just fast tracks approval of these kind of things and launches them. Because it feels like we always have these open air things open really quickly. The turnaround around the turnaround for them in the summer is crazy, but then regular clubs don't open as fast as this at all. But anyway, what can you do? So it continues here. It says courtesy of RA London Open Air Club dockyards will reopen under a new name, um, now called Silverworks Island. The 400,000 square foot, 20,000 capacity, Jesus Christus, venue is launching on Saturday, July 1st. So, of course, when it's really, really hot with solid grooves party, um, what you call it, get well soon, Michael Bibby. Highlights include Scream, Nicole Madubair, Jamie Jones, Joseph Caparati, Antor, and the following day, Armin Van Buren, a state of trance label, will also have a showcase. Um, looking ahead, so it's going to be Tech House and Minimal all the way through there. Makes sense, to be honest. They're going to be the biggest crowds, and they're going to sell it out, and they're going to have a vibe there, even though some people don't like them. I completely understand why they would push that first. Looking ahead on Sunday, July 9th, why in the city will host a numerous drum and bass legends, including Chase and Status, or member, book them once, crazy, and you see in hybrid minds. Run by Broadway live silverworks island is a silver town quays area of east london initially opened as dockyards um hosting parties and likes of defected and andrew deep last september see more photos of silverwork island below looks pretty cool doesn't it i might have to actually inquire to see if i can do a little bit of seasonal work out there i might be a bit of a vibe you know but that looks really really nice as you can see some vent some lineups here wine a city a state of trance and a solid grooves event i'm assuming it's going to be sold out in it solid grooves event um open air on a saturday in flipping east london with Paus and all them man there. It might be sold out, to be fair. Let's see if it's sold out already. Because these guys, they even move tickets in the craziest way. So it wouldn't surprise me if it did end up getting sold out. Let's see what they're saying. Oh, yeah, already. Look at that. Last entry tickets, only 75 quid available. General admission, fourth release. VIP tickets, 100 pounds. What does VIP get you, though? That's the thing I would love to know, these type of things. What does VIP tickets get you? VIP and elevated festival experience included access to the VIP area, dedicated bar and street food venue vendors, entry to the festival via our dedicated VIP lanes, whatever that means, leave and enter from the VIP area into general admission as you wish. Okay, but you can't leave and enter the venue. See, that's the annoying thing about London festivals and places. Once you're in, you're in. If you leave, you can't come back in again. So even the VIP, you can't leave and come back in, but you can go into the general admission and pick up some stragglers on and some slushes if you want to and bring them back to your little VIP booth. But yeah, big up them. And let's hopefully um, see that launch and do as well as it can in the summer months. That looks pretty cool and interesting. I'm not mad at that in the slightest. Um, then we've got another one here, courtesy of RA2. It says Techno Party XXL returns to Manchester's depot in Mayfield this October. That's going to be a big one. 10,000 capacity event has been built as the UK's largest indoor tech experience. It makes sense to be fair. 10,000. Jesus Christos. Um, taking place on Saturday, October 7th, the 10,000 capacity will be featured the likes of DJ Heartstrings, I Hate Models, who I did before. The 999 person playing live, Kiki playing, Kobolsi, Patrick Mason, among others, and Paula Templar will also go back to back with STL. I wonder if Patrick Mason's got the same agent as I Hate Models because they seem to be playing on the same bills a lot, but I don't really think they play the same style at all. It's very weird to me. Let's see if this is true. Oh, I'm just curious to see this because it seems like maybe there's a thing where there's a scheduling conflict or they just purposely always book you with somebody else the same because they want to book you somebody the same let's see let's go he's about okay there's nothing here to see where his booking listing is at let's see if patrick mason has anything to do with booking listing because i'm curious to see maybe if it's the fact that they're both on the same agency hence why they're both getting booked at the same places a lot because i don't really see much overlap between the both of them but i could be completely wrong in this case Okay, nothing here so far. Let's just go on the Instagram then. Um, let's go on Instagram. I hate models actually and see if he's got any booking info there. That's where usually most DJs put their booking info. Let's see if that's the case. Because this will be very interesting development to see if this is what's actually happening here on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's actually check this out. Boom, 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 boom. Cool. It's loading now. Let's see if this is the case. Hmm. 
it's got a link tree here let's go for the link tree maybe this is where the booking info is come on let's get to it tiktok account da, 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 da. okay there's no booking info here for some reason hmm let's just type it in on here then i hate models booking let's see who else he's represented by a pelagio okay there we go a pelagio let's see if it's if if i if um what's his name patrick mason's on there too i don't think he is to be fair but let's double check because them being booked on the same lineup all the time is a bit odd to me to be fair considering how different their styles are but maybe because it's festival season and shit people are just booking whoever um let's see here mysterious dj are you models the south of france okay cool booking request is there nina uh, appalagio let's see who else they've got on there appalagio they've got 999 on there is patrick mason on here i don't see patrick mason is he patrick mason on there patrick no he's not cool so he's an appalagio where's patrick mason patrick mason booking paramount artist okay cool i just assumed he was going to be in the same one but he's not what whatever artist they got on paramount let's see here represented by a guy called Rick. okay they've got james mack uh who else is on here tom needed with tim welsh is that it where's the rest of them this is all they got agents no i was in roster sorry roster let's see roster that's agents what's the roster oh okay cool so richard let's see that they, they've got all the represent okay cool okay so patch mason is represented by the same person that 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 the same agency that's got hector oates sarah um sarah king big up her a deal matrix man big up him paul the templar paul the temple sorry um who else is on here Theo nasha whoever that is spencer parker he looks sick oh i remember spencer parker actually i think i saw him in Berkheim once you are tracks vladimir there was something marcel fengler okay cool fair play fair play fair play let's go back anyway to the article it says run collaboratively with warehouse project teletech and lo-fi xxl is now in its third year that's an amazing link up to be fair so big up warehouse project for putting it together man that's absolutely amazing they'll be able to tap into local promoters and put on this slap banging massive affair builders of uk's large indoor techno experience take place over 12 hours on four stages i'll have to go and check this out mate this might be a meaty family tree um register for access to exclusive 45 pound tickets Let's see if they're still available. Um, when are they going to be available? On the 29th. So they're probably already gone by now, the £45 tickets, to be fair. Um, let's just double check anyway. Saturday, 7th of October, Warehouse Projects. Um, let's see here. Double XL event. We have to wear double. Yeah, there you go. Tier 1, tickets still available. For, it's, that booking fee is. What is booking fees about? £45 for the ticket and a £6.80 booking fee. Like, what does that even mean? What's £6.80? What does that to do? God almighty. Anyway, the full lineup is pretty crazy, really. Alignment, Billy D's, Black, Charlie Sparks, Cloudy, Heartstrings, Hyperdrive, um, I8 Models, Kiki, Kabosi, um, Nina Kravitz is playing there also, Nico Moreno, back to back with Dain, August, Patrick Mason, Paolo, Tem Paolo Temple, back to back with S SNTS, uh, Shlomo, back to back with Sarah Landry, Stan, Stan Christ, TDJ, Trim, Vladimir Dubrushkiv. Okay, cool. Loads of really cool people. I might have to check this out to be fair. I might have to add this to my interesting because I'm definitely going to be looking to go to Manchester in October to check this bit out. This looks fucking fun as hell. So big up Warehouse Project. Big up them, what they're doing. Um, lot of big, big fun event. Really going to be eager to check that out when it does eventually happen. When it does eventually happen. And then quick way to end it with this little topic here, courtesy of Hypebeast regarding Sammy Ross's new a Cold War and Nike Air Max Plus Blue. Um, I was saying before, it, it kind of looks like and feels like, um, based on the articles I've been reading, clearly Sammy Ross has taken a different path and not trying to be too front and centre when it comes to the clothing side of things, when it comes to his brand of Cold War. It looks like he's trying to steer himself more into the contemporary art side of things, which makes complete sense. Having caught the last couple of days of his exhibition at the White Cube in Bermondsey, it's definitely got a lane for him there. His work has definitely been improving um, from what I've been able to see online and stuff that i saw in person so clearly that avenue makes more sense and probably there's way more longevity in being a contemporary
contemporary artists than there is trying to, you know, what's it, chase the trends, but trying to be, still be somewhat relevant on the whole streetwear and fashion design side of things. I think easily, if you wanted to, I think my idea or my impression of the guy was always that he was going to go down the kind of, you know, Armani type of road and turn flipping a Cold War into some behemoth as a, of, a, of a brand. I just kept chugging along and him just there on the forefront designing year after year after year. But maybe actually what might end up happening, he might end up taking it down the Stussy type of road where maybe over time he relinquishes control. He's not doing the design as much as hands on and he puts more of it into the hands of the actual people working in house. And then they just keep churning out decent collection after decent collection after decent collection over, over, over the years. And it becomes the brand that just exists without the association with Samuel Ross himself. Maybe, who knows? But regardless, when it comes to Nike collaborations, him and the Cold War, always smash it out of the cup, always smash it out of the park, sorry. I don't think they've had a dud so far. And I like this adoption um and kind of, you know, interpretation of a Nike T N or what, what we what we used to call T N's back here in London or in the UK overall. And now they're I think effectively called Nike Air Max Pluses. But these look really great because there's a splash of colour. Usually it's kind of monochromatic when it comes to stuff Cold War does, but the fact that he's gone for this really bright cobalt blue type of hue that i think this quite synonymous with a brand actually when i think of a cold war i always think of this kind of slate gray color and also think of this blue for some reason i think they've done this blue and red really well over the season i think if you look back to the older look you would have seen um sparkles a little sprinklings of that blue dotted around place so which is weird because it's one of my favorite colors i love that ultramarine um blue kind of colorway it kind of reminds me again of that kind of classic legendary um painter's jacket that everyone used to wear back in the day with the pockets in them and shit but yeah um the nike air max plus here um that you know uh, samuel ross leaked on his instagram no date on when it's gonna drop so far but they look absolutely banging all blue design um very minimal on the upper strip back in terms of design not much you know accruements going on in the upper and stuff not crazy stuff here and there this looks like there might be a white or a gray pair also so maybe two colors i'm hoping for free but also there might be two colors if you zoom in a little bit deeper here towards the back of the hill tab i think the back of the hill looks a bit translucent so you might see here bits of that i like the addition of the icy soul reminds me of the classic reebok workouts from back in the day with a clear icy soul that used to look amazing when you got them fresh new and maybe over time they would wear in a bit and you could spray it i've got what thing you could put on them there's some sort of application some sort of spray you could use to basically um uncloudy um you know clear icy soles that people used to use on jordan 11s i think back in the day that used to work really well but i do like the addition of those the translucent sole looks pretty decent um the upper i'm really curious to see what the how they finish the upper really what that actually looks like if that's all been kind of embossed because usually these little lines here are usually made of some sort of plastic um so maybe they've kind of made the effect kind of you know with just having it kind of raised to give that effect but instead of having the little plastic bits i like the little addition of the little squares here next to the swoosh the swoosh looks like it might be 3m that looks pretty decent also um like the look of that the shape is absolutely banging all found of that completely and they're probably going to be dropping soon because i saw a picture of Samuel Ross, i think in paris wearing a pair of them as well um out there while he's doing the cold war showroom so clearly these are going to be on their way out there very very soon and in the back there that that looks like a maybach isn't it like a what's that thing called maybach truck in the back there that's a that's a that's a bit of a flex as well to be completely fair um, bopping down the street with the shoes you just designed um in front of a fucking maybach truck that you're rocking with a fucking ap on absolutely mad but yeah the shoes look great loving what they look like um eager to see what the colorways are going to be i'm hoping for free but so far it looks like we've only got two got that blue and we've got the other one as you can see here from the box we've got these little tabs here one looks blue one looks orange so maybe they might be free maybe they might be this blue the white and then an orange like a safety orange which i've seen him feature a lot on his artwork also um there's been that kind of orange um splattered around in places i think there's been a bit of it highlighted in some of the fragrances he's done so it makes a lot of sense if that's the case if we get a blue and an orange and a white sometime soon but yeah these look absolutely incredible love them love them love them as hype you say here there's no official date as you can see no official release information has been confirmed yet but check out the gallery for information soon but yeah i said yeah oh see there we go um nike so this is might be hmm the 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 words here it says designed by so this is an instagram account glass brick vault battered tn so i wonder if these are the four colorways glass brick vault 
battered. Hmm. I wonder. I'm not too sure, but I guess we have to wait and see what the deal is. But I'm eager to see when these finally do drop because I would definitely be purchasing those. I would definitely be purchasing those. No way, shadow of a doubt about that one. Anyway, that has been the Exxon Zing Show, episode number 689. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's the first time, check out the show via YouTube. You know what to do. Smash like it, subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, you know what to do. Also, share it. Leave me a fucking five star review and all that malarkey. Links to the show notes, links to, you know, the stuff I've been discussing actually, like some articles and stuff will be featured in the description. If I did say I'm going to put them on there, you'll see them on there. If not, links to my websites and my things are all listed in the description also. And if you listen to this video, the audio side of the podcast and you will hear my tune of the day coming in underneath my voice right now but until next time my friends i'll see you guys later take care be safe peace